Once again, the fight over voting rights. That's right, all across the country, there are state legislators that are enacting laws restricting the right to vote. But also, there are states who are enacting laws to increase access to the ballot box. This is State of the Water. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Claville, and we'll discuss those laws in just a moment. Welcome back. It's Stay of the Water. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Laville. We want to thank you again for joining us here on WNSB Blazing Hot 91 on the campus of Norfolk State University, home of the Spartan Nations. Behold the green and gold. Again, what a absolutely wonderful Sunday afternoon we have here in Hampton Roads. Wherever you're listening from, we and you're streaming us online at WNSBonline.org on our app. Uh, we hope that you're enjoying the same type of beautiful weather uh, here this summer. Because, again, we're reopening. The world is reopening again. But we want you to also be vigilant, continue to be safe, continue to get your vaccinations, continue to adhere to any rules in your locality and also the CDC so that we can all get through this together. That's right. Here on today's show. We're going to talk about new voting rights laws that are being that are being created to restrict access to the ballot box and also look at states that are increasing access to the ballot box. You know, this is part one of our discussion of this particular topic. And we see that there is a fight taking place all over the country. So you're in for a treat because we're going to examine these laws state by state and take a look at what's happening, because This is your right, your constitutional right to vote, to choose individuals that you want to represent you in your not only your local state, but also federal offices of your respective states. And also to choose the rules that you want to be governed by in your community. But before we do that, here we have a phenomenal, phenomenal release of information and also guests. We have our native son here from the city of Norfolk, Thomas Wilkins, who is being named the principal guest conductor of the Virginia Symphony Orchestra. Mr. Wilkins, thank you so much for joining us here on Stay of the Water. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you. (laughs) Absolutely. Now, for many people that don't know who you are and how important uh, this position is, uh, the Virginia Symphony Orchestra, has just appointed you internationally internationally renowned conductor and native of Norfolk, the first ever principal guest conductor of their symphony orchestra. How phenomenal is that? (laughs) I, I mean, that is, that is something that all of us here, not only in Norfolk, Hampton roads, the Commonwealth of, of Virginia, but really all over the country really should be celebrating. And we are so, so blessed to have you back here in, you know, just, just back home. How, how does it feel to be the first ever principal guest conductor and to be back home? Well, I, I, it, 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 it feels poetic uh, to, to, to be back. Uh, the title notwithstanding, I mean, it's just great to be a part of the orchestra that really introduced me to classical music in the first place as an eight-year-old. Uh, and now I think that's the coolest part. Um, uh, and to really, to really be a part of the family, uh, as it were, and to be a partner with them going forward uh, in, in the growth and development of the orchestra and its relationship to the community. Absolutely. Tell us a little bit about your travels. And I mean, you mentioned being introduced to uh, classical music at the age of eight years old. But before you tell Wait, us about your again, tra- I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you, you, you talk about being introduced uh, to classical music at the age of eight years old. Tell us about that experience. 
Well, it's funny, you know, I didn't know what to expect. I grew up in Young's Park, and I, in fact, I could see the arena theater from my bedroom window, uh, but I didn't know what went on there. And sure enough, when my class gets on a bus and goes over there, here's this large group of people with all these in- instruments in their hands. And I had never heard the voice of the orchestra before. And I was fascinated by Russell Stanger, who was the conductor, uh, because he seemed to have the most personal, intimate involvement with all of this new sound I was hearing. And I thought, wait a minute, that's the spot I want. I want to be <laughs> right there in the middle of all of that stuff and emotionally involved and psychologically involved and spiritually involved. Uh, and I didn't have words for any of that at the time. I was too young, but I knew I was hooked. Yes. Um, and sure enough, here we are all these many years later, and, and now I'm going to you know, be hooked all over again with that same orchestra. <laughs> so from age eight, uh, before you cut, before you're the first ever appointed principal guest conductor, tell us about your your travels and and where you studied and where you've conducted, and how you got back here to your home. Well, uh, <laughs> when I look at my career now, I kind of joke and say, "Well, no one's more surprised than I am when I find myself <laughs> in the places that I find myself." But but the first thing was. Uh, access to music, which is why I'm a, such a big proponent of music education, and especially in underserved communities, because Young Park Elementary School, by f- fourth grade, the next year, we were all allowed to study a string instrument. So I started on violin that year, and, and that just propelled my, my, that just really sort of continued to feed my love for, for music. Uh, and so that happened, you know, all through the course of, t- of, of, my, of my early training. Uh, but the other thing was that there was always teacher support uh, from a middle school. Well, we called it junior high school in those days, a junior high school teacher who right. who uh, encouraged me to, to try to conduct my junior high school orchestra and Reginald Walker, my high school band director, who made me his student conductor. And I got to conduct every single day in high school. Uh, I mean, those were phenomenal opportunities so that by the time I am off to college, I have a serious sense of what it is that I want to do with my life. And also I've had really a great deal of early experience, which was a, a, a gift of all the teachers that, that uh, were in my midst. Wow. So, you know, the, the impact of teachers on your journey, I think that can't be, uh, we can't stress that enough, how important teachers are. And to hear your story of how you were encouraged, you know, by right. your teachers to, to take that next step and look at what, you know, your look where your experiences have taken you and also what you've right. done. You know, so some of the places that you've been, uh, of course, you recently just stepped down as music director at o- Omaha Symphony, but also being a principal conductor of the fabled Hollywood Bowl in Los Angeles, uh, the artistic advisor for education, community engagement at Boston Symphony Orchestra, guest conducting credits all over from Cleveland, Philadelphia, Atlanta, Dallas, New York Philharmonic, and many, many others. And now back home to where it all started. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's a gift, I, 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 I must say. Um, and as I said before, um, you know, I just put my head down and did my work. Um, and, um, you know, opportunities created, created, were, were created for me. But, you know, the other part of the equation, I, I, as I go back to this whole teacher thing, is people, they're, they're the other in addition to encouraging us as youngsters, uh, teachers also were quick to correct us when we were doing something stupid, uh, even if that something stupid meant not working as hard as you were supposed to work. And so that's part of the equation, too. I, I, I've often said that, um, you know, my, the biggest thing I can contribute is, is to be prepared. And I tell young students, wishing without working only leads to disappointment. You know, so <laughs> you have no control over whether or not someone's going to hire you, but you have complete control over how prepared you're going to be. And so I, I think for me that's I, – I, I told a reporter once that I'm a lifelong learner, and he thought I was going to say I was a lifelong teacher. Uh, but I, but I, I, I never am without a hunger for knowledge. Wow. And I think that that will always hold us in good stead. Absolutely. You know, and I think that's that's really the mantra of success. You know, you have to – continue to work and control that which you can work and control and let everything else handle itself. Uh, so 
Right now, I, I know that there is a welcoming event for you, Mr. Wilkins, uh, this Monday, July 19th at 430 at Chrysler Hall, Dress Circle Lobby. There's going to be a phenomenal performance by the Boys Choir of Hampton Roads. And you can register if you would like to go to this event. Uh, you can go to the Virginia Symphony Orchestra website and register for that event. It's at 430 on tomorrow, on Monday, here in the city of Norfolk at Chrysler Hall. Uh, just just curious, when you first heard the symphony orchestra at eight years old, uh, which, which instrument did you gravitate toward? What caught your ear? <laughs> I, I, you know, <laughs> interestingly, the first thing that grabbed me was the snare drum because the first thing they played was the Star Spangled Banner. But I, I think my ears and eyes just roamed all over the place but I must have thought that the cello was cool because I, in fourth grade, when string studies came to my school, everyone had to start on violin. But for some reason, I already knew that I wanted to play the cello. So it must have been that the cello <laughs> grabbed my attention very, very quickly in those very rare moments when I wasn't watching the conductor. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, listen, you, you and I, we talked briefly before this interview, but I uh, uh, just to let you know that we do have a, uh, a a commonality is because when I was in elementary school, I too was drawn to classical music by hearing my first symphony at the age of nine years old, and I gravitated toward violin and played for all, all the way through uh, elementary, middle, and also high school. So uh, definitely my second love, classical music, of course, first is gospel. Uh, but uh, but that's uh, it's, it's it's interesting to hear. From someone's perspective, you know, what instrument they were drawn to. So, <laughs> so what caught the yeah. ear? But the cello is a phenomenal instrument as well. And uh, it's, it's, it's a sound that is so melodic and, and you can make it do so many things. But, but Thomas Wilkins, the new and the first ever principal guest conductor of the Virginia Symphony Orchestra, we want to welcome you here back home. Uh, yes, indeed. Back home, <laughs> uh, on behalf of Norfolk State University, WSB plays a hot name. There's a, what, and there's also a lot of people home. running around that town calling me by my old nickname, too. So, <laughs> 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 Well, listen, everyone listening, if you want to come to the welcome event, it's, it's open and free to the public. It is tomorrow, July 19 at 430 at Chrysler Hall. Or if you want to come to one of the performances, their first performance of uh, Mr. Wilkins' new role is February 18th through the 20th of 2022 um, tickets go on sale mid-august you can go to virginiasymphony.org and come hear norfolk natives own thomas wilkins and the phenomenal virginia symphony orchestra mr wilkins thank you so much for being on state of water and hey, i look forward hey, to seeing my pleasure good to talk to you all right god bless bye well again you know here on state of water you know we we show where we have such phenomenal phenomenal talent uh, here in the Hampton Roads area, more specifically Norfolk. And it's just amazing, amazing to see the talent that comes from here. You know, and we have talent all across the globe, all across the globe coming from this area. And it just shows the importance of cultivating that talent and how that talent definitely comes back uh, to give back. And it's no different than the Spartan Nation here as well and what the Spartan Nation and the alums and the stakeholders that love this institution, love this city, love this area, and love this Commonwealth to give back. And that's, that's, again, one of the phenomenal things about this area that we all love dearly. So part one, we're here to talk about voting rights, the fight for voting rights. It seems like this is something that we hear Every single election cycle, more, more, and more and more, you know, it, it's, I think it's because now we have so many people engaged, scandalous, so many people engaged and so many people that now are, have awakened to what the possibilities are with the power of the vote. We're going to delve into and take a look at these voting laws and how States are enacting new laws to restrict voting. And also, we're going to take a look how states are enacting laws to increase access to the ballot box. 
And we want to hear what you have to think. You know, if, when we talk about these laws, when we talk about the restrictions and, and why, what, are, what do you think is happening? And how do you think we can continue to fight this? In, in our part two, we're going to look at what the Supreme Court is doing or has done in the Arizona law in part two. And also we're going to delve into a federal answer to this under the John Lewis voting rights bill that is currently stalled in Congress. But we're going to take a look now on the state level. 757-823-9110. 757-823-9110. What are your thoughts about the laws that are restricting people from the right to vote? So let's take a look at it. So according to the Brennan Center, there have been more than 20 laws this enacted this year already that is making it harder for Americans to vote. And keep in mind, we're, we're, we're halfway through the calendar year of 2021, and most state legislatures haven't even, haven't even uh, gone into session yet. And we've got these bills that are already on the books and some in the pipeline as well. Let's take a look at it. Between January 1st and, January, and May 14th, 2021, according to the Brenner Center, at least 14 states have enacted 22 new laws restricting access to the ballot. And this is what we call voter suppression. So when I say restricting access to the ballot, we're also talking about uh, it's voter suppression, voter suppression. So already, if you take a look at what happened in 2011 after the election of our first black president, Barack Obama, we've already exceeded the amount of restrictive voting laws since that time. Now, keep in mind, even here in the Commonwealth, there were laws that were put in place by at that time, a Republican legislature or General Assembly, restricting access to the voting, putting up roadblocks, basically. But we saw a turn of events when Democrats took over here in the General Assembly here in Virginia, increasing access to the voter box, right? Access to the ballot. So now we're seeing another turn of events where it's the restriction. And we're talking 10 years later, a decade. I mean, a decade seems so long in politics. Let me tell you, <laughs> a decade is like an eternity in politics and policy. Because by that time, we've had at least one, if not two, or three different presidents, but we've definitely had three different terms of presidents, right? And, and we've also had two to three different terms of legislature that are in office at that time. So it's very interesting to see how this fight always continues. So also, by October 2011, we're talking 19 laws that were, in, I mean, of, of 2019, uh, 19, 18, 19 laws restricting votes, access to the ballot box were already enacted in 14 states. So as of June, as of June, 17 states have enacted 28 new laws that restrict access to the vote. 28 new laws on top of the ones that we already have. What are some of these laws that are that that we're talking about? About one, let's look at look at the percentages of it, and then we'll nail down to which states are enacting what. So let's take a look at the percentage. One third of state legislatures are currently in session, right? Only one third. So that means as of June twenty twenty one, that means two thirds of state legislatures are coming into session. But of those one third of legislators who are still in session, at least 61 bills with restrictive provisions are moving through 18 state legislatures as we speak. 61 bills restricting provisions. Also, 31 of those have passed at least one chamber. Uh, only the state of Nebraska has what we call a unique. Uh, only one chamber, but in the United States, 49 out of the 50 states have bicameral legislature. So they have a House and a Senate, very similar to the federal system. 
except for Nebraska. So with that, we have 31 half of those bills have passed at least one chamber. Another 30 have some sort of committee action. So when we talk about committee action, we're talking about a hearing, an amendment, or a committee vote. So already in the United States in 2021, there have been at least 389 restrictive bills in 48 states. What does that mean? 389 bills have been introduced in 48 of the 50 states in the United States to restrict access to the ballot box. So let's go back and when we talk about the bills, that's why I wanted to break it down for you to let you know where we are. The way a law becomes a law, it first starts out as a bill. So a bill is introduced, which is a suggestion of what a law should be. Once it's introduced into the state legislature, it then goes to a committee, a subcommittee. Then the subcommittee takes it up. They tar start to talk about it. And these committees are broken up and by party. So basically, if a legislature is 50-50, 50 Democrats, 50 Republicans, then you have half members of that le- of the legislative body who are Republican, half that are Democrat. And that's kind of how it goes. But whoever's in power is usually the chair of that committee. Then it goes, it goes to the subcommittee. Then the subcommittee, they'll talk about it and then they'll hash it out. Uh, one side says we like this, other side will say we don't like that. And then it'll go with markups, basically striking some things. Then it will go to a full committee. It'll go to a full committee, and then after that full committee, during that time period, you'll have a hearing. So it's open for debate. So usually you have what's called special interest groups that'll go in, and those special interest groups will voice uh, their position in favor of or against that particular bill or that provision. And then after that, then it'll go back, and, and they'll add certain aspects of it, take it out. Then it goes to the full floor, and that full floor then will debate it, and it'll take a vote on it. And once that, once that bill is voted on, it goes to the next chamber, you, from the House to the Senate. They'll vote on it as well, usually at advisement from the House on what they should and should not do, and then any provisions that they want. And then after that, it'll then go back, and then it'll go to the governor's desk, and then the governor will either sign it or veto it or basically let it die or let it become a law. And that's how a bill becomes a law. So currently, there are 28 new laws enacted already. So we went through the bill process. Now, of that, you have 61 restrictive, uh, at least 61 bills with restrictive provisions moving through 18 state legislatures. 31 have passed. 30 of those 61 are waiting a hearing, committee, hearing, action, whatever the case may be, or an amendment. And... But overall, before it becomes law, vetoed, or whatever the case may be, or it ends up dying. But ultimately, we now have 389 suggestions that are about to be introduced into the state legislatures across the country that may end up becoming law. It's a long process. It's a process that we have to be engaged in. But it's a process that's needed. And if we are engaged in this process, then we can make a difference. But let's not get into that just yet. Let's delve into what these bills are. So of these bills, now keep in mind that this is on the state level. Now, why is that important? This is not, these are not federal laws or bills. This is on the state law. Why is that important? Because the Constitution and the courts have agreed that it is the states that are given the power to execute free and fair elections based upon the Constitution and the federal laws that have been enacted. So what does that mean? That means when... Only in the original Constitution, only when white males were given the right to vote, then all those states enacted processes in order to give those individuals the right to vote. Then, when 
the Voting Rights Act was created, well, when the Constitution was amended to give black, free black males the right to vote, states then enacted restrictions. Uh, we, we call during the time of segregation and Jim Crow to limit the right to vote of freed black men. So that's where you get the literacy test, the grandfather clause, the poll tax. Guess how many bubbles in a bar of soap? Guess how many j- beans in a jelly bean jar? Or And if that didn't stop them, they just outright kill them, right? Then when the Voting Rights Act was signed into law, which we'll get to uh, in part two when we talk about solutions and chipping away at the Voting Rights Act. When we get to that, the Voting Rights Act then restricted states from enacting laws that punish or, or restricted access to the ballot box for, due to intimidation. And with that, they had to enact processes in order to give the right to vote to everyone for free and fair elections. So that was from 65 all the way to, let's just say, you know, 2000 and uh, 2005. And then we talk about the Holder case, all right? The Holder Shelby County versus Holder was then eliminated pre-clearance. So now you have states that are enacting bills and also not just bills, but also when we talk about rejoin lines, which we'll get to in part three of our discussion of voting rights. That's where now the states are given the power to draw lines of who can be elected. So that's the process that we're looking at. And while the state is so important, state legislatures have the power. All politics is local. So now what we're looking at is during the time period, we have 28 bills with expansive provisions that have signed into 14 states and 115 bills with expansive provisions moving in 25 states and 45 bills passed in at least one chamber and 70 have some sort of action. This is in clash with restricting access to vote. So states are acting, but is it enough? Is it enough? Let's take a look at some of these bills that are acting to law restricting the right to vote. We're going to just take a look at some numbers. And then in the second half of the show, we're going to delve into exactly what those laws are and in which states. So let's look at some raw numbers. At least 16 of these bills that have passed make it target mail-in voting restrictions. Now, these are in 12 states. They make it more difficult for voters to cast mail ballots that count. Also, six laws shorten the time frame for voters to request mail ballots, including Georgia, that reduced that window more than one half. Also, five laws make it more difficult for voters to automatically receive their ballots. Nine laws in eight states make it more difficult for voters to deliver their mail-in ballots, including states like Arkansas. And also, you have three laws that impose stricter signature requirements as well for mail-in ballots, while three others impose stricter or new voter ID laws for mail ballots. In addition to that, we've got eight states that have enacted 11 laws that make in-person voting more difficult. According to the Brennan Center, three states enacted four laws that impose new or harsher voter ID requirements for in-person voting. Four laws make it fully uh, make make four laws make faulty voter roll purges more likely. Basically, now you're going to become more disenfranchised because now your name will be purged off of voting rolls if you don't vote a certain amount of time. The state of Montana eliminated election day registration and moved up its registration deadline. Three states limited the availability of polling places, including Montana. And then, of course, Georgia reduced early voting in many counties by standardizing early voting days and hours. Why is this important? Access to the ballot box. We saw what happened. It literally changed change the trajectory of our nation by putting in individuals in office that will create opportunities for 
the people. In other words, the people's will. But you see mail-in voting, new, new or stricter ID requirements enacted. It's a fight. But in our second hour, we're going to delve into which states have enacted what. And also, we're going to look at which states have enacted access to the ballot box. We'll be back after this commercial break. It's it summertime, and the blazing hot 91 days of summer is heating up with prizes and surprises from area businesses, tickets to shows and concerts, including a cash payout that's never been done in our history, making you a blazing hot winner. You're the ninth caller. <laughs> Now, how would you feel if I told you that you are the ninth caller? Thank you, Jesus. Thanks a lot for calling. You're calling number nine. Woo! Hi, I'm Tanya from Virginia Beach, and I just went from Blazing Hot 91. You can be the next big winner in the Blazing Hot 91 Days of Summer. Your opportunity can happen at any time. Keep listening all summer long for the Blazing Hot 91 Days of Summer. Blazing Hot 91. The Rugged Evolution Foundation presents a back-to-school supply drive. Looking for donations of pencils, pens, papers, highlighters, binders, notebooks, all the supplies needed to start the school year. Rugged Evolution Foundation back-to-school supply drive. Collection period July 1st to August 21st. Drop-off locations. Rugged Evolution Headquarters, 809 Live Oak Drive, number 10 Chesapeake. Herbal Pharmacy, 4215 Granby Street, Norfolk. Anointed Touch Hair Salon, 5347 Lila Lane, Virginia. Beach, Blessed Roots, 7639 Granby Street, Norfolk. Rugged Evolution Foundation, back to school supply drive. For more information, visit WNSBonline.org. Blazing Hot 91 is a proud media partner. Welcome back to Stay in the Water. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Claville, and we thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful Sunday afternoon here in Hampton Roads in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Wherever you're joining us from, listening to us and streaming us online at WNSBonline.org or on our app. We hope that you, too, are enjoying this beautiful summer weather. Make sure you continue to enjoy it, but also be safe as you continue to vaccinate, as you continue to adhere to your local and also the CDC restrictions to keep everybody well. On this particular state of water, we're talking about new restrictive voting laws that are being enacted all over the country. And we're going to look at states that are getting it right, increasing access to the ballot box. But this fight is something that you can win. In the first half hour, we took a look at the various uh, number. We broke it down by numbers and percentages of states that are in act, state legislators that are enacting restrictive voting laws. We also discuss why it's important, important for states to be engaged on the state level because how the Constitution and the laws within the federal government and the courts have uh, backed states and given them the power to enact processes for their votes, to give a fee, free and fair election for all of their offices and also bills that go through their particular state. We, we want to know what you think. 757-823-9110. 757-823-9110. As we take a look and really peel back, you know, the various laws, restrictive laws, and all these laws that are restricting access to the ballot box, why is this the case? We saw it happen in 2011 after the election of Barack Obama, our first black president. We saw it also happen now. Again, we saw it happen uh, in 2012. We saw it happen uh, in Shelby County versus Holder. We saw it happen uh, in North Carolina. We saw it happen in Texas, where in the, in the Fourth Circuit here in, in North Carolina, where the Fourth Federal Circuit said by surgical precision, the laws that they enacted were to disenfranchise black voters by surgical precision. Those are the words of the federal court, appeals court of the Fourth Circuit located here in Richmond, Virginia. That's powerful. That is, that's extremely powerful. But they're at it again. These states, and I have to note that the states that are enacting these laws are led by Republican state legislatures. All right? So uh, I, I'm just giving you the facts. We don't tell you what to think, how to think, but we give you both sides. Just like we're talking about states that have enacted restrictive laws and telling you what those laws are. 
We're also telling you about the states that have enacted laws that increase access to the ballot box so that you can make your decision on what you think is best to do to fight this. So we took a look at, in the first half, one-third of state legislatures who were in, that have been in session, two-thirds that are going to be in session for the rest of this year. But by June of 2021, 28 new laws have been enacted, come from bills to laws restricting access to the voting box. We have 61 additional bills that are in tow. Right now, in legislative uh, uh, sessions, 30 have been voted on, at least one chamber. The other 31 are now moving through. They're just awaiting some type of legislative action, like a hearing, committee hearing, or the like, or before they actually go up for a vote. So, as you can see, these bills are rolling through, but out of 48 states, right now we have 389 bills already filed to restrict access to the voting box. We know in the state of Georgia, they made it illegal to give people water that are standing in line. Water. They made it, you can't bring out, you can't give anyone chairs. All right? Now, we saw the lines of older citizens, senior citizens that are in line voting because they understand that value, what they did to fight for that right to vote. We see what happened. And Georgia said no. To fight that, we saw sports arenas open up access, give people the opportunity to come inside various stadiums and the like. So we saw what took place on both sides. But should we do that? I mean, this should be an action that we do as a locality, as a state, to ensure that all of its citizens have the best opportunity to vote. So let's take a look at the various states and what they've enacted. So according to the Brennan Center, The effect on voting, the new restrictive laws, uh, the windows were shortened to apply for mail-in ballots. That happened in Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, Iowa, Kentucky, Oklahoma. The shortened deadline to deliver mail ballots, again in Arkansas, make it harder to to remain on absentee voting lists, Arizona and Florida. Eliminate or limit sending mail ballot applications to voters who do not specifically request them. Georgia, Iowa, Kansas, eliminate or limit sending mail ballots to voters who do not specifically request them. Florida, restrict assistance in returning a voter's mail ballot. Arkansas, Florida, Iowa, Kansas, Kentucky, Montana, limit the number, location, or availability of mail ballot drop boxes. Again, the number, location, or availability of mail-in drop boxes. Florida, Georgia, Iowa, and Indiana. Keep in mind that in some of these localities, they only have one box you can drop your mail-in ballot off. And it's located in areas where it's hard, it's hard for people to be able to do it. Listen, I think this is, on its face, a law that is just not smart. And I think on its face, it is discriminatory. All you have to do is put drop boxes by Mailboxes where people drop their mail off. It works. We've, we've had mail drop boxes for about a little bit over a century now. It works. You can drive up, drop your, drop your mail off, and you're good to go. It works. But states want to limit that. Also, impose stricter signature requirements for mail ballots. Arizona, Idaho, Kansas have all introduced bills. or These are new laws, restrictive laws, actually, already passed. To tighten or impose voter ID requirements for mail voting. Florida, Georgia, Montana. To tighten or impose voter ID requirements for in-person voting. Arkansas, Montana, Wyoming. Expand voter purges or risky or risk falter. Faulty voter purges. Iowa, Florida, Kentucky, and Utah. This also is a very dangerous law. Because now, if you don't vote in certain cycles, they purge your name from the voting rolls, and you may think, hey, you know, life happens, uh, COVID happened, and you have tragedies in your personal life, and you just don't vote for various local or state elections. You should vote every time, by the way. You should vote every time, but things happen. And are you just disengaged and you don't vote, but presidential election comes up, you want to vote, you haven't voted in four years, 
You go to vote where you voted last time, and guess what? Your name isn't on the roll. So now your vote doesn't count because you can't go back and register. Now your vote doesn't count because you can't go and contest it. So now you become, you sit in line for an hour, maybe a couple hours if you're in these states, who knows, four hours, a whole day because of the limited availability. And now your vote doesn't count. So what do you do? But this is, this is the effect of discriminatory laws that disenfranchise voters. Now, I didn't say what type of voter. I just said voters. But we know where these laws are targeted. Where these laws are targeted around black and brown people. Again, I mentioned the Fourth Circuit uh, decision in the North Carolina case where the, in 2015 where the, where the court said, that the new voting laws that were enacted that were restrictive were to disenfranchise black voters by surgical precision, surgical, surgical. It doesn't get any more targeted than being surgical. Well, I'm not, I'm not done with these new restrictive laws. Let's take a, let's, let's look at them a little closer. So now here's the one I was talking about which I think is just bad law, and we know who is targeted at. In the state of Florida and Georgia, everybody, the legislatures have banned snacks and water to voters waiting in line. Come on. Snacks and water? I can't make this up. You can go to Florida Senate Bill 90, Georgia Senate Bill 202. It's in the law. It's law. Eliminate Election Day Registration, Montana. Reduce polling place availability, location and hours, Iowa, Montana. Limit early voting days or hours, Georgia and Iowa. Limit early voting days or hours. Now, I, I'll say this. Personally, I love early voting. I love it because I can go in. I can go in it like I'm, as if I'm coming in right before I come into the office or during my lunch hour or if I'm leaving early, want to get ahead of the traffic, I'm able to leave the office, I can go vote. You can do it on Saturday. You know, we do it as a family on Saturday. I mean, it's just, we make it a family event. We get the stickers and say, I voted. I mean, it's just a great thing to do. So I love early voting. I love it. I also love election day. But I tell you, <laughs> to vote for me, I love early voting. But not just that. I mean, for me, how easy it is and how um, accommodating it is. Just think about people that have to work these, these weird hours or work shift hours and things of that nature that have individuals that they're caring for, loved ones, and they just can't make it on election day. They can't afford to spend two, three, four hours in line of their day to vote. They can't do it because they don't get that day off because their loved one is sick, because they have to get children here and there. Early voting is a great thing. We need to keep it. But we see states that are now moving to eliminate, eliminate that. Now, those are laws. Those aren't bills. Those are on the record books. So if you are in Georgia and you are Florida and you give somebody a snack or a bottle of water, you can be criminally charged. All right. But there are restricted bills that are moving through legislatures as well. Again, as of May 14, 2021, according to the Brennan Center, there are at least 61 bills with restrictive effects moving through 18 state legislatures, uh, in addition to the bills that have already become law. Okay? Let's take a look at, look at Texas and Michigan. All right? Texas has been in the news. More than one-third of these moving bills are in three states. Texas and Michigan, they have nine each, and Wisconsin has seven. <clears throat> so let's, these bills are, again, attacking vote by mail. They're attacking new or stricter voter ID requirements. They're expanding voter purge practices and increasing barriers for voter registration. Okay? In other words, four bills would pro- prohibit or restrict the ability to register to vote on Election Day. And also to restrict voting in special elections or runoff elections. Uh, very similar to what happened in, 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 in Georgia, where um, two 
new senators were elected in runoffs. Individuals were able to register to vote for that runoff. There were bills targeting that say, hey, you can't vote in this if you weren't registered to vote in the general election. So let's take a look at Texas. In Texas, because the situation is so dire, what they have done is the Democratic legislators couldn't stop it. So what they did, they left the state. They left the state, flew to D.C., met with federal legislators or congresspersons uh, to talk about the help that they need. They need a federal bill. Now, I mentioned in the first half hour, I gave the history of how the original Constitution only gave white males the ability to vote. The After the abolition of slavery, uh, the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment uh, also provided the access for black, free black men to vote. The 19th Amendment also, during women's suffrage, gave women the right to vote. But it wasn't until the 1965 Voting Rights Act that removed all those barriers of Jim Crow and legalized segregation that allowed for all people to vote free and fair. Okay? So that's what's the state Democrats in Texas legislature, also the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus, and, and the Democratic Party in several other states together talked about this issue. They did a press conference about it. The Virginia Legislative Black Caucus, uh, we have several members from Norfolk State University alums who are part of that caucus that are moving the state forward in policies, leading that from Senator Lucas, Senator Sproul, Delegate Hayes, Delegate Lamont Bagby, who is a chair of the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus, and Delegate Candy King. They are the ones that are helping to push those that narrative through. So in Texas, they left because that's all they could do. If you don't have a quorum, you can't vote. So they left in order to not be able for the Texas legislature not to be able to pass those restrictive laws. But can you run every time? These are not full time legislators. They have jobs. They have careers. They have families. Can you get on a plane every time? Well, the governor of Texas, Governor Abbott, uh, gave Sergeant Orr the ability to arrest them. They say, bring them back to vote. And basically, he's going to call a special session after special session after special session after special session after special session until he gets these laws passed. That's the fight that's taking place right now. Texas, Michigan, Florida, Georgia, Wisconsin, these are the, and, I'm, and we're getting ready to gear up here on the East Coast. We take a look at Pennsylvania, take a look at Virginia and other states where there's going to be a fight, you know, for the right to vote, the access to the ballot box. So this is the paradigm shift. We see what happens when individuals access the ballot box. Look at the laws that have been in place to help people, the common person. So you ask yourself, why is this fight? If we're passing laws to help the common person, we're passing expanded health care in which people fought against it. It was this is Russia. Remember that? When McCain was alive and people were at these town halls and this misinformation through these entertainment venues of talk show hosts that are pushing misinformation and lies to say, oh, this is bad. You know, you're going to take this and take that. Well, guess what? COVID happened. I think uh, the Affordable Health Care Act came in really, really handy to help a lot of people because it was a good law anyway. Matter of fact, it was, was, it was a cutting pace of a Republican think tank, a conservative think tank that President Obama copy and paste it from them, brought in the same uh, consultants, met with Republican lawmakers. How can you fight against something that you champion? And they did it anyway. Didn't make good sense, but it made good politics to disadvantage one side. But when you disadvantage one side, you disadvantage the entire country. When it's, you have policies that are created to help the entire country. So why is this fight? Well, if you go to 
a meeting. You can find it on YouTube, Twitter, your social media. Rick Santorum stated that we don't want the will of the people to be done right now. This was in a meeting. Of course, somebody recorded it. But he said that Republicans don't want the will of the people to be done and saying that Republicans are opposed to Democrats carrying out the wishes of most voters. That the Constitution itself was created to protect the minority, not the majority. In the original Constitution, it was created to protect the minority, the minority ruling class. It was not created to protect or give rights to the majority. Amendments still did that. That's why it's a living and breathing document. It's meant to be the foundation but then it's also meant to guide us and change to accommodate society as it is. Now, that's one thought. There are many thoughts out there. You have strict constitutionists. You have others. There were some that believe that it's part living, part foundation, and you don't break the foundation up. I'm one of those. Whatever that foundation is, if it's right, and it is right not just for this generation or that generation, but for all generations. But that's where the fight is. Because if these laws are enacted, then the will of the people will be done. So let's take a look at states that are getting it right. States that are enacting laws that are expanding access or opportunities to vote. So when we take a look at six states that have enacted laws to seek to make voting more accessible, they're seeking to make voter, voter, voting more accessible for voters with disabilities, Uh, Washington and New York are for restoring voting rights to people with past convictions so that every American living in the community is eligible to vote, especially after you paid your debts to society. I'm against calling someone a convicted felon because you paid your debt. No more should you have that label. If you served your time, if you committed a crime and you served your time, then you served it. No more should you carry that label. You now have an opportunity to come back into the community and be a productive member of society. I think we need to look at that. Also, two states made voter registration easier for young voters. State of New York expanded automatic voter registration to include State University of New York. And the Commonwealth of Virginia expanded pre-registration to 16-year-olds. Again, these are things that work. Not only that, but also seven, uh, at least seven laws would expand the availability of early voting. New, New Jersey, Kentucky codified, and codified simply means put into law, in-person early voting. And the state of Massachusetts expanded early voting through June of 2021 of this year. At least eight laws in six states make mail voting easier, not harder. That includes five laws in four states that expand mail ballot drop box access or ballot drop-off locations. And five laws in four states that codify procedures, again, made it law, is in the code, so that voters learn of and can fix mistakes and defects in their mail ballots. So these are laws that are expanding access to the ballot box. These are states that are saying, listen, we have a society that have made it hard we made it hard for them to participate in the process. So we, what we want to do is increase access to the ballot box for them. Not only that, but of the, those are laws. Those are laws. When we talked about laws and bills. So those are on the books now in those states. Virginia, Indiana, Massachusetts, Maryland, New Jersey, also New York. These are laws that are on the book right now. But there are also bills making their way through state legislatures to become law. Okay, now of this, you got 115 bills with expansive procedures that's moving through 25 states. These are bills that have already become. This is in addition to the bills that I just mentioned that already become law. New York, they've got 20 bills moving through to expand uh, provisions Uh, and they're the most by any state. You've got uh, 13 moving expansive bills through con- Connecticut. You've got 10 in Oregon uh, that make it easier uh, for individuals to vote. You've got 59 bills moving 
across 20 states that are making it easier to obtain a mail ballot and a ballot that counted. 13 bills expand availability drop-off boxes. 12 bills expand the deadline for mail ballot receipt or postmark, giving voters more time to return their ballots. You've got nine of the bills moving with establish or expand notice and cure opportunities for mail voters. Nine of the bills moving through would establish no excuse voting or put forward state constitutional amendments. Also, you've got 32 bills moving in 16 states that would expand voter registration opportunities. Ten bills that would require automatic voter registration or what's called AVR. So when you hear AVR, that's automatic voter registration, which I think is a good thing. I think when you turn 18, just like you have to uh, register for selective service, which should be automatic, you also are registered to vote in whatever state that you're in. You got 10 bills that would establish that. 10 bills would establish or expand same day or election day registration opportunities. Five bills expand voter registration deadlines. Three bills, it gives 16 and 17-year-olds the opportunity to pre-register to vote. Why is that important? 16 and 17-year-olds get driver's license and permits, right? I'm I'm the father of teenagers, and uh, that's what they do. That's what they have. You have 25 bills moving in 11 states that would establish or expand early voting. These include Louisiana and Oklahoma. They'll increase the number of days or hours per day of early voting. New York, three bills will require counties to provide a minimum number of early voting locations based on their population. And also, another will require an early voting location or election, what we call election day polling location on any college or university campus with 300 or more registered active voters. I think that's game changer for universities because a lot of times, scandalous you know, kids, and I still call them kids, but college students, young adults, have to go off campus to go vote. Of course, you have some that are engaged in the process, then they are volunteering. But how about you set up that location in the student union, and you come in, you vote in the student union on election day, and it's done. I think that is a great idea that should be across the board, across all states. How great would that be, Spartan Nation, if Norfolk said the Commonwealth of Virginia put in a law that would have a ballot box there in the Commonwealth of Virginia on every university campus at the student union. Why not? <laughs> you know what? I think that's an idea. I think that's an idea that we should uh, suggest to our state legislators. So you heard it here on Stay the Water. <laughs> you heard it here first. So we're going we're, we're gonna to look into that. So I, so Delegate Hayes, Delegate King, Delegate Lamont Valley, Senator Lucas, Senator Sproul, I hope you're listening because we're going to look to expand that to universities. Also, you have 10 bills moving in five states that will restore voting rights. And I for those with past convictions, I think that's key. I think that's key. And these six bills will restore the right to vote upon release from incarceration rather than completion of probation or parole. Ladies and gentlemen, the fight for voting rights is something that we've seen since the beginning of this country. The fight for who has the power to enact laws to be, that governs them, to enact policies and procedures for which society has to follow, and to enact the representatives of their community to speak on their behalf in the local city council, in the state general assembly or legislature, and also in our nation's capital, the wonderful United States of America, our country, in our the people's house, the House of Representatives, and the Senate chamber. This is a fight. It's a valid fight. It's a fight that our people, our ancestors fought, gave their lives for, and continue to push. So, it doesn't stop. It continues to go on. And what we're going to do on part two of the fight for voting rights, examining these new laws and policies enacted, we're going to take a look at what the Supreme Court is doing in the case of Arizona. And also, where does the John Lewis voting rights bill, where, where is it at? At what point? And as we look back one year after the death of John Lewis, I think, again, this is a great way to honor his legacy, 
with that name on his bill, something that he fought for. <laughs> but again, just like any time we're here, we have this wonderful conversation and we run out of time. As you can see, we can go on for hours, but we can't. But one thing you can do, you can go to our social media and hear the show again or tune in every Sunday at one o'clock here on WNSB Blazing Hot Day 1 on campus of Norfolk State University. We'll see you next week.